Tom Thumb. A poor woodman sat in his cottage one night, smoking his pipe by the fireside, while his wife sat by his side spinning. How lonely it is, wife, said he, as he puffed out a long curl of smoke, for you and me to sit here by ourselves without any children to play about and amuse us, while other people seem to be happy and merry with their children. What you say is very true. How happy should I be if I had but one child? If it were ever so small, nay, if it were no bigger than my thumb, I should be very happy and love it dearly. Now, odd as you may think it, it came to pass that this good woman's wish was fulfilled, just in the very way she had wished it. For not long afterwards, she had a little boy who was quite healthy and strong, but was not much bigger than my thumb. So she said, Well, we can't say we haven't got what we wished for, and little as he is, we will love him dearly. And they called him Thomas Thumb. They gave him plenty of food, yet for all they could do, he never grew bigger, but kept just the same size as he had been when he was born. Still, his eyes were sharp and sparkling, and he soon showed himself to be a clever little fellow who always knew well what he was about. One day, as the woodman was getting ready to go into the wood to cut fuel, he said... Oh, I wish I had someone to bring the cart after me, for I want to make haste. Oh, Father, I will take care of that. If my mother would only harness the horse, I will get into his ear and tell him which way to go. Well, well, we'll try it for once. <laughs> when the time came, the mother harnessed the horse to the cart and put Tom into his ear. And as he sat there, the little man told the beast how to go, crying out, Go on, jump! And thus the horse went on as well as if the woodman had driven it himself into the wood. It happened that the horse was going a little too fast, and Tom was calling out, Gently, gently, when two gypsies came up. What an arching, Daddy! There is a cat going along, and I hear a cat a talking to the horse, but yet I can see no one. Oh, that is queer indeed. Let us follow the cart and see where it goes. So they went into the wood, till at last they came to the place where the woodman was. Then Tom Thumb, seeing his father, cried out, See, father, here I am with the cart, all right and safe. Now take me down. So his father took hold of the horse with one hand, and with the other took his son out of the horse's ear and put him down upon a straw, where he sat as merry as you please. The two gypsies were all this time looking on, and didn't know what to say for wonder. At last... One took the other aside and said, That little urchin will make our fortune if we can get him and carry him about from town to town as a show. We must buy him. So they went up to the woodman and asked him what he would take for the little man. He'll be better off with us than with you. I won't sell him at all, said the father. My own flesh and blood is dearer to me than all the silver and gold in the world. But Tom, hearing of the bargain they wanted to make, crept up his father's coat to his shoulder and whispered in his ear, Take the money, father, and let them have me. I'll soon come back to you. So the woodman at last said he would sell Tom to the gypsies for a large piece of gold, and they paid the price. Well, here we are, then. And where would you like to sit now? Oh, put me on the rim of your hat. That will be a nice gallery for me. I can walk about there and see the country as we go along. So they did as he wished, and when Tom had taken leave of his father, they took him away with them. They journeyed on till it began to be dusk, and then the little man said, Let me down, I'm tired. So the man took off his hat and put him down on a clod of earth in a ploughed field, and Tom quickly slipped into a mouse hole. Good night, gypsies. I'm off. Mind it look sharp after me the next time. Oh, then they ran at once to the place and poked the ends of their sticks into the mouse hole, but all in vain. Tom only called farther and farther in, and at last... It became quite dark, so they were forced to go their way without their prize as sulky as could be. When Tom found they were gone, he came out of his hiding place. What dangerous walking it is in this ploughed field. If I were to fall off one of these great clods, I should undoubtedly break my neck. At last, by good luck, he found a large empty snail shell. This is lucky. I can sleep here very well. And in he crept. Just as he was falling asleep... He heard two men passing by, chatting together, and one said to the other, How can we rob that rich parson's house? Hey! How can we rob that rich parson's house of his silver and his gold? I'll tell you! What, what, what was that noise? What? 
I'm sure I heard someone speak. Oh, they stood listening, and Tom said, Take me with you, and I'll soon show you how to get the parson's money. But where are you? Hey, where are you? Look about on the ground, and listen where the sound comes from. At last, the thieves found him out, and lifted him up in their hands. <laughs> you, you little urchin! What can you do for I, us? What can you do? Why, I can get between the iron window bars of the parson's house and throw you out whatever you want. That's a good thought. Come along, and we shall see what you can do. Aye, aye. When they came to the parson's house, Tom slipped through the window bars into the room and then called out as loud as he could bawl. We have all of us oh. here! Uh, at this, the thieves were frightened and said, Softly, softly, speak low so that you don't awaken anybody. But Tom seemed as if he didn't understand them and bawled out again. How much will you have? Shall I throw oh. it all out? Now the cook lay in the next room, so she sprang out of bed and ran to open the door. The thieves ran off as if a wolf was at their tails. And the maid, having groped about and found nothing, went away for a light. By the time she came back, Tom had slipped off into the barn, and when she had looked about and searched every hole and corner and found nobody, she went back to bed, thinking she must have been dreaming with her eyes open. The little man crawled about in the hayloft and at last found a snug place to finish his night's rest in, so he laid himself down, meaning to sleep till daylight, and then find his way home to his father and mother. But alas, the cook got up early before daybreak to feed the cows, and going straight to the hayloft, carried away a large bundle of hay with the little man in the middle of it fast asleep. He still, however, slept on and didn't awake till he was actually in the mouth of the cow. For the cook had put the hay into the rick and the cow had taken Tom up in a mouthful of it. Good luck a day! How came I to tumble into this mill? Down he went into her stomach. It is rather dark here. They forgot to build windows in this room to let the sun in. A candle would be no bad thing. Though he made the best of his bad luck, he didn't like his quarters at all. And the worst of it all was that more and more hay was always coming down, and the space left for him became smaller and smaller. At last he cried out as loud as he could. Don't bring me any more hay! Don't bring me any more hay! The maid happened to be just then milking the cow and hearing someone speak but seeing nobody and yet being quite sure it was the same voice she had heard in the night, she was so frightened she ran off as fast as she could to her oh, master the oh, parson oh, and oh, said, oh, oh, sir, sir, cow be talking. But the parson said, woman, thou art surely mad. However, he went with her into the cowhouse to try and see what was the matter. Scarcely had they set foot on the threshold when Tom called out, Don't be then the parson himself was frightened, and thinking the cow was surely bewitched, told his man to kill her on the spot. So the cow was killed and cut up, and the stomach in which Tom lay was thrown out upon a dunghill. Tom soon set himself to work to get out. A hungry wolf sprang out, and swallowed up the whole stomach with Tom in it at one gulp and ran away. Tom, however, was still not disheartened. And thinking the wolf would not dislike having some chat with him as he was going along, he called out, My good friend, I can show you a famous treat. Hmm. Well, where is that? said the wolf. Then Tom described his own father's house. You can crawl through the drain into the kitchen and then into the pantry and there you will find cakes, ham, beef, cold chicken, roast pig, apple dumplings and everything that your heart can wish. The wolf didn't wait to be asked twice. So that very night he went to the house and crawled through the drain into the kitchen and then into the pantry and ate and drank there to his heart's content. As soon as he'd had enough, he wanted to get away. But he'd eaten so much that he couldn't go out by the same way that he came in. This was just what Tom had reckoned upon. And now he began to set up a great shout, making all the noise he could. Oh, oh, will, will you be easy? You'll awaken everybody in the house if you make such a clatter. What's that to me? You've had your frolic. Now I've a mind to be merry myself. Oh, I'm little Tommy Tumpkin. I don't see a single oh, one. Oh, 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 oh. And he began again singing and shouting as loud as he could. The woodman and his wife, being awakened by the noise, peeped through a crack in the door. But when they saw a wolf was there, you may well suppose that they were sadly frightened. Tom cried out, Father, Father, I am here! The wolf has swallowed me! Oh, heaven be praised! We found our dear child again! Then he aimed a great blow. 
and struck the wolf on the head and killed him on the spot. And when he was dead, they cut open the body and set Tom free. Ah, oh, my little, little Tom, what fears we have had for you. Yes, Father, here I am again, safe and so. Well, you're come back, and we'll not sell you again for all the riches in the world. Then they hugged and kissed their dear little son and gave him plenty to eat and drink, for he was very hungry. So Master Thumb stayed at home with his father and mother in peace. For though he had been so great a traveller and had done so many fine things and was fond enough of telling the whole story, he always agreed that after all, there's no place like home. <laughs>